These plants go to extremes, growing where others dare not go. From hella hot to chilly cold to super salty, these plants thrive in places most would wither and die. These are the extremophiles of the plant world, the extremophytes. Hi, I'm Tasha the Amazon, and you're watching Flora Logic. Today we're talking about plants that live under extreme stress. We call these plants extremophytes. What makes extremophytes so interesting is their ability to thrive in stressful environments. And that's something we're not always the best at. We tend to be a species driven by our emotions, and that's especially true when it comes to our financial investments. Investing is essential if you want to grow your capital and thrive in your environment. But most top equity firms are projecting less than 5% returns or even negative returns in the near future. Many people haven't considered one of the safest investments on the market though, artwork. Masterworks is a platform that allows you to invest in artwork. Instead of having to invest in stocks such as oil, you can feel good about investing in a diverse portfolio of art by the masters. Whether you're a fan of Gustav Klimt, like I am, or you're more of an Andy Warhol fan, Masterworks gives you the opportunity to invest in a market that's valued at $1.7 trillion and has been projected by the financial experts at Deloitte to grow by $900 billion by 2026. Masterworks.io is the only platform that lets you invest in the same artwork that billionaires do for a fraction of the price, and they know what they're doing. Masterworks returned 31% to their investors in 2020 and 32% to them in 2021. Now, investing should only be done if you have the means and you know the risks. There are no guarantees, and you should speak with a financial advisor before making any decisions. But we're big fans of the work our friends over at Masterworks are doing, and it's super easy to get started. In just a few clicks, you can create an account, browse the artwork, and diversify your portfolio with a socially responsible, stable asset. You can gain priority access by clicking my link in the description, and it also really supports the channel. So go check it out. And thanks for sponsoring this video, Masterworks. Salting the earth was a tactic historically used by conquering armies to prevent their conquests from being able to rebuild and regrow. While too much salt in the soil or water is deadly for most plants, there are a select few that are known as halophytic, or salt tolerant. For these plants, salting the earth would be like rolling out the welcome mat. Only about 2% of terrestrial plants are halophytic, meaning that these salt-loving weirdos are a rare breed. The genus of Salicornia are the most salt tolerant plants in the world. Their name even comes from the Latin word for salt, but they're also commonly known as sea asparagus, sea beans, and pickleweed. These edible and delicious plants range from the Americas, Europe, Africa, and Asia, and can be found in the saltiest places you can think of, like salt marshes and on the seaside. Optimal growth for Salicornia is achieved at about 1.75% water salinity, but it can tolerate water twice as salty as seawater, which is a savory 3.5%. You can even water your Salicornia with seawater. Plants in the genus Thelangella are true weirdos in terms of what they can take from their environment. Commonly called saltwater cresses, like Salicornia, these plants are halophytes and can tolerate high levels of salt. But Thelangella take it a step further, and bounce back even after being frozen solid, and can also regenerate after long periods of drought. Thalangella salsiginea, the plant formerly known as Thalangella halophila, has become the poster child in the study of extremophytes and the model for stress tolerance. Because of this, it even had the honor of having its genome sequenced. Turns out it's gone through so many adaptations to be able to live in extremes, its genome is twice as large as its close relative, Arabidopsis thaliana. Those specializations need a lot of code. Our next extremophyte gets the award for northernmost plant, Saxifraga oppositifolia. More commonly known as purple Saxifraga, this plant thrives in the high Arctic, specifically the northernmost part of North America, where winter temperatures average minus 23 to minus 32 Celsius and it's also found at high elevations in the Rocky Mountains and the Alps. It's such an iconic tundra plant that it's the official flower of Nunavut, the northernmost territory in Canada. It's so used to the cold that it's actually difficult to grow in milder climates, which is the exact opposite of how I thrive. When it comes to high altitudes though, there's one plant that comes out on top. Aramogony bryophylla is a small flowering plant that takes the prize for highest altitude. Native to the Himalayas, 
This plant has been found growing at elevations of over 6,000 meters, or more than 20,000 feet. That's two thirds the way up Everest. Let's crank it up and move to extreme heat with a plant that might be part of your skincare routine, aloe vera. Aloe likely originates from the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula. For thousands of years, we've been hacking this succulent's adaptation to living in hot, dry desert for our own moisture. This goopy gus is such an essential part of our self-care that aloe vera is a $13 billion a year industry. The thick and juicy inner mesophyll layer of the leaves evolved as a reservoir of water for the plant to keep up with photosynthesis during droughts. Now grown everywhere in gardens and pots around the world, this unique adaptation to extremely dry temperatures is what made aloe vera such an essential part of humanity. Interestingly, aloe vera is one of the few plants that we actually call by its binomial, or scientific, name. Another plant that can take the heat is Yucca brevifolia, otherwise known as the Joshua tree. Native to the deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico, and famous for the Californian park that bears its name, the Joshua tree can live in extreme heat, 35 to 40 degrees Celsius in the summer, for hundreds of years. Death Valley isn't so deadly for Joshua trees. Not only can they survive sweltering desert temperatures, mature Joshua trees are covered in a fire-resistant bark that can even help them survive fires. Special mention for their ability to take the heat goes to the mosses of Yellowstone Park, which grow around the park's geysers. These geysers spew out superheated water that's hotter than boiling, and the mosses think that's just fine. Although mosses don't usually love the light, these thrive because they have zero competition. Since they're rootless, they don't have to worry about the soil temperature as much as rooted plants. To counteract the effects of exposure to so much sunlight, many of these mosses have developed adaptations to be able to live in the light. Some have clear-tipped leaves that reflect light, while others wrap their leaves around their stems to shade themselves from the sun. Now we take our quest for the most extreme plants from the land to the sea. Seagrass usually grows close to the surface where there's abundant light, but Halophilia decipiens, also known as paddle grass, takes things a little deeper. Growing in beds as deep as 30 meters down where sunlight is harder to come by, this seagrass has come up with some unique adaptations to maximize its exposure. It has a high ratio of leaves to non-photosynthesizing parts, and those leaves are arranged in a way to prevent self-shading. Self-shading might sound like a newfangled type of self-deprecation, but it's what happens when leaves overlap, blocking each other's light. Paddlegrass also has the ability to quickly colonize a sandy bottom when light conditions are just right, allowing it to make a home where almost no other plant could. What we can learn from extremophytes is that even when things get extreme, there's always a way to adapt, survive, and even to thrive. So what should we talk about next? Drop your suggestions in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for new episodes every week. Take care.